Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Ramson Parva from the uh, from the Safe Step, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited to welcome you all to uh, demonstrating health and safety due diligence with wearable computing with Cameron Stevens, uh, founder of the Safety Innovation Academy. Uh, now, this is the second of a, of a three part series we're running with Cameron. And so for those of you who missed the first webinar, making the business case for digital safety investment, uh, you can find a recording of that on our website. Uh, now, an introduction to Cameron for those of you who don't know him. Uh, Cameron's a health and safety professional dedicated to step changing health and safety performance uh, with emerging technologies uh, and is now considered Australia's leading safety technologist. He juggles his time between employee, founder, startup advisor, and, and volunteer roles. Uh, all with the relentless pursuit to improve the health and safety of work with technology and innovation. Um, now, uh, just as a quick FYI, there will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end. So we just ask you to, to enter in your questions in, in the Q&A section, and we'll get uh, Cameron to, uh, to answer as many of those as he can. Uh, and, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll hand over to uh, Cameron. Thanks, Ram. And uh, welcome, everybody. And a quick... Uh, Acknowledgement of country on uh, from the Mandoon country that I'm standing on today. The traditional owners are the Wajak Noongar people, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And thanks very much to the Safe Step, uh, the team that are on the line uh, for uh, providing this content to uh, your reach with your um, amazing network. And thanks everybody for taking the time to join live, and for those of you that are that are watching along um, with the recording. So. Quick cover of the agenda today, and I don't know whether or not we'll take the, the full hour, we'll just see how we go, but um, what I would like to do today is unpack uh, what is going on in relation to, uh, I guess, the use of technologies to do remote safety management, in particular assurance, due diligence, uh, understanding of the, the state of, uh, I guess, the operational context of what we're doing uh, when we're physically unable to get to sites. So we'll be talking about due diligence a little bit. I, I am not going to unpack the definition of due diligence and what due diligence activities are, going to go straight into the ability of how we can uh, gain access to sites and the status of controls uh, that are mitigating major issues in our work sites using technology. And that's where I'll be focusing. So to do that, I want to give you a bit of history of wearable technology and how it's emerged from or evolved from the 2006 era of the GoPro through to the types of technology that we're using in the field today. And I'll be using, uh, I'll be demonstrating to you the, the types of solution stack. So by, by the stack, what I mean is the connectivity, the hardware, the software, and the considerations that you need to be able to successfully deploy technology to do these types of activities. And then I'll go through some examples of how people are doing this right now in the workplace. And we'll also finish off with some change management considerations before we go into Q&A. So uh, just a recap, it's actually a four part series that we've um, collaborated together on with the Safe Step. Uh, the first one was making the business case for digital safety investment uh, and the recordings available. Uh, this is what we'll be going through today. Well, then we're going to be talking about ethics and safety technology, privacy considerations, those types of things, which we'll touch on a little bit uh, in, the, in the presentation today. And then we'll finish off with what's next and what can we look forward to in 2022. So very briefly about me, just to give you some context of the background for those that haven't met or seen me before. I'm an undergrad physio who did the master's in uh, ergonomic safety and health, so human factors master's. And I consider myself a concierge, someone that effectively connects and communicates uh, operational context with technology. And I have a background in uh, oil and gas, water utilities um, after I finished as a physio and have a very strong focus on innovation and technology for health and safety outcomes. Uh, and I guess if you looked at those uh, locations, um, working in Alaska, Papua New Guinea, those types of locations are literally you know, some of the most remote locations in the world. So uh, I've been doing remote, um, using remote technologies to support health and safety outcomes through the majority of my career. 
So let's have a look at the current state of where we're at. And when it comes to due diligence as a, in a nutshell, and I'm going, I'm going to be very fluid with my definitions here about, um, and the traditional folks out there will be saying, you know, there's a fundamental difference between assurance and audit, and there's a, and there's a real complexity around what due diligence means. I'm going to simplify it right down to this when it relates to health and safety. If you, so what are the current risks that you have in your business? So the hazards that exist and the risks that are the result and outcomes of interactions with people, process, plant in the workplace. So what are the current issues we have? How well do we understand them? And what controls are required to be put in place to make sure that those hazards and risks are mitigated? And realistically how so one one how do we know what risks exist particularly as senior level managers and directors in an organization so a board for example how does the board know what are the current issues that workers face in the workplace as it relates to health and safety and what are the required controls to mitigate those issues and what is the status or the health of those controls so that's what i mean by due diligence and what I found when I was working as a health and safety manager in my, even in my most previous role, is when we got to end of month reports or we got to perhaps something like a, um, a, a board a health and safety and sustainability committee meeting, uh, my role was to put together these uh, status reports of uh, effectively how well we were controlling the major accident event risk. And what I would end up do be, what I ended up doing was I would collect all of this data and then fundamentally what the board would see was a dashboard. It was usually quite a, a nice, pretty colored dashboard, maybe with a little bit of supporting text, uh, possibly with a report that went with it that gave a little more detail in a, a small number of uh, concerns, mostly things that had had uh, accidents or incidents according, uh, related to them. But other than that, it was literally a dashboard. So that dashboard didn't really provide, in my view, uh, a true understanding of the context of those hazards and those risks in the business. And it certainly didn't really unpack exactly what was happening around the, the status of the controls. So the current state right now is it's very difficult to gain context, uh, particularly in this rapidly changing environment uh, with uh, the pandemic. Uh, obviously, those of you that are currently situated in Melbourne and, and, and Sydney right now have challenges getting to your work sites. So how do we get decision makers into those work sites in a safe way and get them to get the context that they need to understand the health and safety risks that exist in the business? Now, if we step down a lower level here to, uh, if you're looking at a hierarchy in an organisation, but just managers or supervisors or people that uh, need to understand how work is occurring, how do we give them access to the work in a way that enables them to feel like they're there, but they're not actually there because they, they literally can't get there right now. So that's the, uh, the challenge and the current scenario that we're in. And what we're finding is that um, businesses have been very reactive to this. So they haven't necessarily anticipated the change and been strategic in their delivery of outcomes. Uh, and the technologies that support these types of um, uh, needs. So what's happening is we're seeing people just grab what's available and what's available to the majority of our workplaces are laptops and tablets and mobile phones. So we're using handheld devices to go out into the field and conduct these types of remote um, remote due diligence activities, remote audit assurance activities. So we are out there on site with our phones, uh, hands, you know, using the device and we're, we're going around like this. And that's getting us to a point, but it's only getting us so far and it's not really adding the value or giving us the, the quality of information that we need in a form factor that's um, really giving us our outcomes. So. What I'd like to do today is talk to you about types of technology that exist on the market that are shifting the way that we do this. But to do that, 
we're going to go back a step and go through the evolution. So in 2006, uh, we saw the first um, GoPro come out and it was, it was a phenomenal revolution uh, in relation to cameras because what it enabled us to do is it actually, it wasn't just the camera itself that was, um, or the technology itself, it was sparking the imagination of, of the community. So what it enabled us to do was to take a, a video camera and put it into a case that was rugged, lightweight, easy to use, had decent battery life, but we could effectively give the viewer the perspective of that person doing amazing tasks, things like parachuting or surfing on a big wave, going inside, you know, like a, a barrel of a wave. It was phenomenal, the, the uh, imagination that that inspired in, in the public. And once people had access to that technology, they were able to go and do phenomenal things with that technology and give us um, some really amazing footage and insight and build empathy to those sort of, it was really developed by the founder as a, uh, as a tool to look at extreme sports, but we were able to use it for all sorts of things. And we still use GoPros for, for amazing things. The following year in 2007 was actually the year that the iPhone came to market. So you had now a, a computer in your hand and it was really the first time that we had full compute power that was mobile that we could take with us. And once connectivity started to get better and we started to see the emergence of 3G and mobile, um, uh, I guess the mobile connectivity, we had a phone that had the compute power needed to run very sophisticated software, apps started to come to market. We had the connectivity to support the connection to do the live two-way feed. Plus we had mobile cameras in the form of the GoPro. So what's happened since then is those ingredients have become more lighter weight. They've started to come to a point that they have um, evolved into a really sophisticated wearable solution. And let me just pause for a second as the aeroplane flies above me. Um, certainly no shortage of aeroplanes here in Perth uh, at the moment, up into the mines. So what has happened is we've taken these technologies and they've collided to the point now that we have these wearable computers that have everything that you would expect to have in a GoPro, in a mobile phone, uh, a really sophisticated mobile, smart tablet, smartphone, and you're able to wear them. And that's now where we're starting to see. We saw that the, the first evolution of Google Glass come out and it came out before its time. And what that did was it, um, it disrupted um, people's concerns around privacy. And it was a really poorly um, implemented technology. There's now an evolution of that on the market, the Google Glass Enterprise Edition 2. But um, what that was tapping into was uh, some of the social norms that we'd seen been happening ever since, I guess, the first person uh, movies were being shot. So if you can pull yourself back to something like Jaws, if you've watched Jaws before or Halloween or one of the Saving Private Ryan, one of those types of movies where the filmmaker was putting that, um, that shot from the perspective of that uh, you know, the character that was, um, and in the case of Jaws, it was the character of the shark, where you would get this perspective from the viewpoint of the character. And socially, we've become attuned to that. It's almost like a view voyeuristic point of view. And getting that first person perspective into a work site is giving us now access, like in one of those movies, that first person. Our, uh, our youth, and I guess I'm in that... Uh, I grew up with the first person shooter games, uh, the computer games that give you that perspective of you are the person holding the, the weapon. And that um, is, is now ubiquitous for um, particularly people that grew up in the computer game era. Uh, we have been socially attuned to accepting first person point of view. And with things like Snapchat, um, TikTok, the types of social media platforms we have now that are giving us this insight into people's lives. And what's happening is this, this amalgamation of all these technologies uh, with the ability to have improved connectivity that is giving us now a translation and a social acceptance that it's okay for us to start using cameras to access into the worksite. 
So there are some challenges around change management and we'll talk about them at the end of the presentation. But from a public standpoint, we're actually getting used to these technologies. So we're used to carrying phones around, we're used to using cameras all the time, we're used to seeing people in from the perspective of first person. So why not translate that into the work site? Why not design particularly purpose-built software and hardware that can be used to get to leverage all of those social norms and give us insights into the workplace. And that's really where we're at. So the types of solutions um, and, and what you need to be successful, uh, we're going to unpack in this, in this session, uh, section of the session. So first of all, you need to understand the context of your workplace. So a construction site has far different use case context to an oil and gas facility, to an underground mine, to um, a, a hospital or some other workplace. So we first have to understand the context of the workplace and the type of people, the type of PPE, the chemicals, whether there's a hazardous area and we need certain certification. And from there, we can start to build our solution stack. So if we look at uh, PPE as an example, when it comes to a wearable computer or a wearable camera, people need to be able to continue to wear the camera whilst also wearing the PPE. If that's a mask, if it's goggles or glasses, uh, impact protection, face shields, hard hats, we need to be able to ensure that workers are not compromising on their PPE. So when you're selecting a particular type of hardware, you need to first understand the use case context, the PPE that is required, and make sure that that hardware is suited to the use case context. You then need to have a look at um, other things like how much situational awareness or how much awareness of the surrounding do people need when they're wearing these types of technologies. So you don't want the technology to be impacting the person's ability to interact with their work environment. Most high risk work environments, of course, have high what I call high environmental intensity. So they have a, a large amount of information that's needed to be managed, a lot of complexity in that information, potentially uh, a lot of um, ambiguity going on. You need to have conversations and this technology needs to not impact uh, that ability when you're in the workplace. So environmental intensity needs to be balanced out with um, the digital solution that this technology offers as well. And what we're finding is that there's effectively two types of um, technologies that exist that can, you can wear um, that are the head mounted and they either are binocular devices. So they require you to use two eyes to view the screen or the scenario that's being played back to you or monocular. And when it comes to high environmental intensity environments, so places where you need large amount of situational awareness, it's critical that you have um, as much ability to view the workplace as possible. So if I, if I show you now um, virtual reality, so virtual reality is, a, is, is full digital intensity with no environmental, almost no ability to access your environment. They do have these little cameras on the outside here that give you this ability to see the outside world through a camera. But fundamentally, once I put it on, I literally have no ability to, to really see anything. And virtual reality is absolutely not a candidate for um, doing remote due diligence. So those types of or remote safety management in, in really any format, it's very much for the classroom. And then once we move outside into the work environment, we need to be able to maintain that environmental intensity. So if we're going to use two eyes, it's not really going to be likely that we'll be able to get um, the ability to focus on our work environment. So what we're finding or what I'm finding is that the single eye devices are far more effective to be doing these types of tasks. So when you start researching the types of products that exist on the market, binocular devices are probably not going to be as um, uh, really able to be used to do uh, high risk environment work control reviews or audits or coaching type activities out in the field. So when you start looking at single eye devices, 
then it, there become some really interesting scenarios there as well. And what we need to look at is the weight of the device. So does the device cause additional neck and shoulder strain? How easy is it for you to see the display? How big is the display? How bright is the display? Can the display be uh, looked at in daylight or does it need to uh, only be able to be looked at in, indoors? And there are certain products that on the market that can only be looked at indoors because there's not enough uh, intensity in the luminance of the screen to be able to be seen outdoors. Everybody has a, a series of eye dominance as well. So if you are wearing a device on your eye, um, so we'll be talking a bit more about the RealWear device, which is, uh, I'm an employee of RealWear, so there is a little bit of bias here, but um, this device is situated under the line of sight, in this case of my right eye. 70% of the population have right eye dominance. 29% uh, of the population have left eye dominance. So if you have a device that can only be worn on the right eye because of the design, then you're going to be not able to use it for 30% of the population. So devices that have the ability to be moved between left and right are the types of devices that you really going to want to be looking for. Now, what we're trying to achieve with these, um, uh, with this perspective is to get, is to have a camera and a camera and some audio that's going to be able to stream audio visual data. So the minimum requirements that you need if you're going to be wearing a head mounted device is a minimum of 30 frame rates a second. What that means is that when I move my head left and right, I'm not going to make the person on the other end of the call seasick basically. So when you're using your mobile phone and you're, you're doing a WhatsApp call or something like that, and you're moving around, you'll be getting a minimum of 30 frame rates a second, and your image will probably be electronically stabilized. And they're really minimum requirements that you need. So if, you're, if your solution is anything less than 30 frame rates a second, it's highly unlikely that you're going to get a good result. The second is noise cancellation. You really do want to make sure that you have good quality noise cancellation, and that can be achieved in a variety of different ways. But ideally, your, soft, your, your hardware and your software solution will include noise cancellation. Because when you're outside and you're talking, um, and right now my microphone doesn't have noise cancellation, so when the aeroplanes fly across, it disrupts the ability to have crisp audio. And when you're out on a work site around heavy machinery or high noise environments, you need to make sure that you have noise cancellation. Otherwise, uh, you're not able to get a good quality call. From there, we also then need to look at the image resolution. So if you want to take photos or videos, the resolution of your images needs to be sufficient enough for your use case. So typically something like a 16 odd megapixel camera is probably sufficient enough for you to get high resolution images that you can use to do uh, assessment remotely. And if you're going to have a video, you really want to be trying to get up there at least 720, uh, 720p, which is um, the resolution that would be probably appropriate for you to get relatively decent definition. 1080p, which is um, would be even better. And now uh, the camera that I'm currently using is a 4K camera. And if you could get a 4K camera, uh, that you could wear out on site, that would be phenomenal because you will have um, really excellent image quality. And right now there is, uh, I think there's just emerging um, some of the technologies that have 4K streaming, but majority of them are still at 1080p. So these things are probably getting quite technical, but when it comes down to it, the basics are the frame rate has to be enough. So enough frames per second, so that when I move my head, I'm not getting a really jittery movement and the image quality needs to be sufficient so that it's not grainy and you're not getting this kind of VHS cassette type, um, you know, uh, old black and white footage um, scenario. You want high quality images to get real true experience that you're physically there. So to enable that, um, the hardwares that you'll purchase, the, the cameras, they're just cameras, they're cameras and computers. So they need software. And certain software uh, is available on the market. There's a variety of different uh, options. And those softwares will have different features to support remote work. 
Uh, most of the technologies and the software technology that you'd be familiar with are the ones that we're using now. So Zoom, uh, Microsoft Teams, WebEx Teams, those types of key collaboration tools uh, are available. Generally, those uh, technology or those software platforms aren't suited for areas of the world with really low connectivity. So something like a Microsoft Teams call, for example, will probably need around about um, one and a half megabytes per second worth of download and ideally the same in up, so upload and download data to enable you to get a good quality feed. Uh, all of the softwares will optimize uh, and prioritize voice first. So they will always make sure that voice is uh, nice and synchronous and clear. However, what will happen is the frame rate and the resolution will drop and the image quality and the resulting experience will be reduced. So that's dependent on your connectivity. And this is one of the main reasons why uh, people haven't immediately gone and said, yes, we'll go and get these types of wearable interfaces and we'll go out into the field and do our audits and assurance and health and safety coaching and remote safety advisory because we just don't have the connectivity to support it. Now, there are softwares that are specifically designed for this type of work, and they work right down to the really low bandwidth uh, level. So literally kilobits worth of data, really, really low um, requirements. And they have specific video codecs that are inbuilt in the software to enable you to do that. Um, now, those particular softwares are uh, uh, are purpose-built, so they're designed specifically, and um, there are many, many of them, and uh, that's one of the things I do on a daily basis is to, is to marry up the, the use case requirements with the software and the hardware and the connectivity. So when we get back to connectivity, uh, there are a variety of different options about the way that these types of computers connect to the internet uh, to give you that live uh, feed. Now, those options are going to be Wi-Fi. And again, some people will immediately say, we don't have Wi-Fi. Uh, there'll be cellular coverage, so mobile hotspot. So your 4G or if you're lucky, 5G coverage. Again, people say, oh, I don't have that coverage. Like we can't do that in our environment. Uh, there are things called LTE, which are uh, basically private SIM card type networks. So private networks that are set up specifically for you to connect via cellular through a SIM card. Uh, and again, you know, they're probably something like $3 million to implement a private one. So places like mine sites will have those, but certainly not for your average work site. Uh, and then we have uh, satellite and low orbit satellite connectivity. And there are some phenomenal um, use cases out there at the moment, out in the middle of the Australian outback using these low orbit satellites, the Elon Musk uh, Starlink program as an example. Um, but when it comes down to it, investing in uh, a stable connectivity solution really is uh, at the crux of being able to ensure that you're able to do these types of remote work. And I do uh, several coaching engagements at the moment where I am working with health and safety professionals about to how, how do you have that conversation with IT about building the business case to develop your connectivity to support these types of activities because let's face it, it's not just health and safety outcomes that are going to be improved with these types of technologies. It's also your general uh, ability to manage uh, operations, maintenance and business in general, if you have the connectivity supporting your digital business. So I'll give you a quick overview of like what the, the real wear headset looks like, just as an example. And there's others on the market I can talk you through others that exist on the market um, if people want to get in contact with me. Uh, companies like Vuzix, which have the M400 and the M4000 and the Blade glasses. There's Google Glass Enterprise 2. There's the Iris Stick H1. There's Epson BT. There's many other uh, products on the market. Uh, I work with this one on a daily basis and it has some features that are really um, beneficial to the to the health and safety sphere. So high risk environments, drop proof, dust proof, waterproof, uh, able to move the boom arm away from the line of sight so that you don't get, um, so you can improve your situational awareness and uh, you know, heavily ruggedized for the industrial context. So um, 
I don't want this to be about real wear specifically. What I want this to be about is understanding there are different options on the market um, and that this is all about leveraging first person perspective. So ne let's now have a look at what we mean. So what, what do I mean by like, what do you get when you wear one of these? So this is a, a video recording that I took of a site, me wearing a head mounted tablet. I don't have any audio on this specifically, um, but it's giving you an insight into a chemical plant. So this is what a chemical plant looks like. You've just been brought onto the board of directors and you wanna get a first person view of what's going on in the facility. You can have conversations with the work crew. You can see what's going on. You can understand the integrity of certain things. You can see there's a leak there very briefly as I went past. But that movement there is me moving relatively quickly through a plant. And that needed at least 30 frame, weight, frame rates to make sure. And that was not electronically image stabilized. So it was still a little bit choppy, but that's the perspective that you get. And once you take that out into the work context, you're able to do quite phenomenal things. So this is an example of um, Nigel from Wally Parsons is a senior HSC advisor at the Rio Tinto Goodlowry mine. And he uses uh, the real headset uh, and it could be any other headset, as I said, provided it met the use case context. He's doing in-field troubleshooting, real-time risk assessment, gaining, uh, collecting evidence for incident investigations, uh, doing audits and virtual tours and safety interactions and leadership, uh, uh, leadership interactions up in the Pilbara. So what you're able to do is be in your office and or be in a boardroom and stream live into the operational context. And it's quite phenomenal uh, the types of conversations that I'm hearing at the end of when I get invited into these into these proof of concept and um, proof of value conversations. I'm in those conversations listening and it's quite phenomenal the type of conversations that we're able to have when you have a really good, well-designed solution stack to support your use case. Uh, Josh Bryant, absolute legend at Mitchell Services, has taken and grabbed this opportunity with both hands. Uh, he does a lot of excellent work with the Realware device. Um, this is them on a cold morning out, I think it was somewhere in, in New South Wales, uh, effectively doing remote coaching and uh, going back into the board to, to verify critical controls. And then we have the consultants of the world that are effectively going through. So process safety, risk management. Uh, and then uh, for those of you that are aware of um, Gembas or silent Gembas, uh, basically virtual walkarounds where you're able to get uh, context of the work environment and understand what people are doing either silently or, uh, or virtually. Uh, look up Gemba if you're interested as to what, um, uh, what, what that means. And then uh, again, the consultants doing uh, remotely supported uh, inspection, test, certification, compliance activities uh, in real time. And again, these are the types of environments that we're seeing people work in. This is um, CEDEXO supporting their health and safety due diligence. Um, all of these uh, are from LinkedIn, so they're all publicly available. There are many, many privately, um, uh, privately accessible uh, or content that's only privately accessible because of the sensitivity of, you know, bringing boards into um, operational context. We don't have the footage to show you, unfortunately. Um, here's a really good example uh, of uh, Josh Bryant using the device. Let's see if this is going to work. No, it's not going to work. I'll uh, try and get the link to you. But basically, this is... Um, a really good quality example of what we're seeing uh, in the workplace is the use of tablets with real wear devices, or let's just call them wearable tablets. So in this case, we've got the health and safety management software on the tablet requesting the worker to do a review of the work site and the critical control. And what's happening here is the worker is wearing uh, a head mounted tablet and they're streaming live into the boardroom to do a verification of the control and then documenting that at the same time on the tablet. So all of the audio visual data is streamed live and then uh, integrated into the system. And the, uh, the tablet is being used to 
uh, verify and then create that dashboard that we talked about right at the start. So that um, it's providing context to the dashboard that the board are looking at in real time. So that leads me to the final part of the presentation, which is change and the hardest part, I guess. So, I mean, you can take my word, you, you're gonna have to take my word for it. And I know there's a few people on the line that uh, um, I've been working with. I think I can see Carol Crane from Austria. Hi, Carol, hope you're doing well. And um, uh, there's a few other people I think I can see on the line there that are um, on their journey with this type of technologies. And I think they would agree with me that it, the hardest part is change. And we're seeing pioneering businesses getting the hardest part of the change as well, because they're right at the front end of that disruption. Um, so a few tips from me when it comes to trialing out these types of technologies. And also uh, if I preempt a question in terms of how much this types of stuff, how much these type of things cost, a wearable interface is probably gonna cost you somewhere between, once you get everything that you need, it's gonna cost you somewhere between $2,000 and $3,500 uh, Australian. So that's um, roughly the cost of implementing something like a wearable computer. So it's the cost of a laptop, basically, a wearable laptop. Um, but once you've gotten past the ability to document your business case, and if you want to go back to the first presentation that uh, I did with the Safe Step collaboration, uh, if you want to review that webinar, talk about making the business case for digital safety investment. So let's get past the fact that there's cost involved and we've, we've already gone past that. It's really about people. And interestingly, uh, there's this tension between, I, I use these technologies, perhaps not a wearable one, but I use phones and tablets and computers in my hand at home all the time. And I have um, very little resistance to the use of the technology. So it's generally not about the fact that the technology is hard or difficult or um, complex to use. It's actually about the culture that underpins why a workforce would or would not embrace technology. Now, it's typically not um, specifically to do with wearables itself. Um, it's more to do with the camera and the fact that you are now inviting someone in to see what I see and feel almost um, with me on a daily basis what I'm doing. And some uh, pockets of organizations uh, do not have the culture to support that change. And it's, it's, like I said, it's really nothing to do with the technology itself. It's actually to do with the underpinning values, beliefs, uh, and the communication and the what's in it for me type messaging that's missing. So getting engagement really early before you've made your investment decision about talking about making things uh, doing things differently about uh, leveraging the agility that we've had to start to portray with the disruption of COVID-19 and the way we're having to do things differently now, capitalising on that and starting to ride that wave with early engagement and going, we'd really like to try out these types of technologies. Are you interested in being involved? And if not, why? And starting to understand those. When you're selecting your hardware, software and uh, bundling together your connectivity, you have to do it to be solving a problem, not just to be seen as being innovative. So it's very, very important that you understand the complexities and the challenges of your use case and the, uh, you know, to seek guidance on how to build that, um, that use case stack. So you have to be designing your solution to be specific for the workers and the work context, um, thinking that you can have one set up in one area of the business, but that's uh, a, a manufacturing facility indoors and think that that's going to be the same as in an underground mine is, is, is probably not going to be the case. So you have to be very specific and contextual with the way that you build your design. And the last part really for me is about being really open with your mindset about opportunity. When I worked as a health and safety professional as a dedicated role, I, whenever someone used to come to me with a, uh, something new, my mind would immediately go to what are the issues, what are the challenges, what are the risks, what are the concerns with this? And um, rightly so, I mean, that was my role profile. But I've found it, uh, I, because I've, I'd been studying these types of mindset shifts, 
I realized that there was this whole other side to the coin that I could be asking is, what are all the great things we could be doing with this if we were able to implement it? How could we potentially do things better if we had these types of solutions? So really balancing risk with opportunity. And when it comes to wearable computers, there are absolutely risks that you need to consider. The weight of the device, the distribution of weight on the head, the uh, weight of the device for different um, body shapes and types, um, the ability to conform with different facial features uh, and eye um, distances, uh, eye strain, eye fatigue, uh, situational awareness, cables that could be impacting, heat of the devices impacting skin sensitization, the type of um, accessories that could potentially cause interference with PPE. There are absolutely some risk considerations. And if anybody is considering, considering implementing any type of wearable technology uh, or wearable computing in their enterprise, uh, this is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'd love to help you out. If you've got any questions, feel free to let me know. And on that, um, this is the way to contact me. If you want to get out your phone now, if you're not on your phone listening, um, scan the, uh, the code and you'll get access to me on LinkedIn. Uh, otherwise you can contact me with the concierge at the Safety Innovation Academy. But I would like to wrap up there with uh, about 15 minutes or so to see if we want to start unpacking some complex questions. Uh, so let's see how we go with that. If not, we can um, get you a little bit more time back on your day. So that was a lot to cover in um, 45 minutes and a lot of speaking. So if you have questions, please let me know. And Ram, over to you to see if there's anything coming through. Thank you, Cameron. So I'll hand over to the attendees. If there are any questions that you have for Cameron, it would be great if you could uh, just pop them into the Q&A box just at the bottom of your screen um, and, and we can get Cameron to go through that. I'm really interested um, if people can put their put their comments comments in the in the chat. Um, what do you think? Why would you not want to try this? Or what would stop you from trying this? Um, there's a there's an industry vertical that I'm finding uh, very difficult to shift mindset to try these types of devices, and that's the construction industry. Uh, the underlying culture and uh, resistance to the use of technology seems to be quite strong and it's very much about monitoring and personal monitoring and personal privacy and there's a strong culture that I've seen with various um, clients that I work with that um, they're finding it very hard to overcome in that industry whereas there are other industries like even like the food manufacturing industry that are absolutely phenomenal, that are really, really engaged and would love to see this type of technology. So it's quite interesting seeing the industry differences. So uh, we have any um, coming through? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we do indeed. So Louisa, thank you for, for the presentation. But a question is when it comes to information security, how robust are the platforms out there? Good question. So the platforms themselves transfer the knowledge from A to B. So it's actually the software that has the, um, the information security requirements on them. So almost all the devices are literally just a, uh, a tablet. So they can be effectively pin protected and managed remotely. So if they're stolen, they can be wiped. So, but most of the time there's no data stored on the device itself. It's all throughput. So what happens is you have end-to-end -end encryption and that's based on the software and the software vendors themselves need to demonstrate to you as the, the procurement party that they have relevant IT security measures in place. For example, ISO 27001 compliance with a cybersecurity standard, um, but fundamentally you want end-to-end -end encryption and certain software have certain uh, ways to, to manage that. So one of the use cases that I've been working with is actually uh, international investors purchasing assets from Australian businesses. So you have someone wearing the headset, walking around and showing off the asset and people on the other end of the call are actually ready to purchase it. And they're held in little encrypted classrooms. Um, so yeah, it all comes down to the, to the solution design, but IT security is absolutely paramount in all of these uh, 
conversations. Great question. Um, the the other one and and uh, an interesting one as well from from Mark is in answer to your question, um, you know what would stop you is the perceived benefit against cost. I mean that 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 would be a hurdle for his organisation. Yep. Great. And I think um, I would. For me, it would be almost the perceived benefit of using a mobile phone versus using a, uh, a, a tablet. I really hope that organisations are not at the point that they're not doing anything remotely. Um, I think if we're only relying on face-to-face, -face, the latency between, particularly now with travel, the latency between issues happening on site or interactions and and needs from workers on site and the delay that it takes to travel there, the, the type of behavior change that you get when you are on site, the unlikely event that you're not actually gonna have the high risk task happening at the time that you're physically there, it might happen two hours later or two days later. Um, if you're not using mobile in any format, I hope that at least you've, you've figured out that value and if you haven't, then I'd love to have a conversation about how you can demonstrate the value of that. But differentiating the value between uh, wearable versus tablet is an excellent question. And fundamentally that comes down to user experience. And I could go on for that for, for ages, but it's really more about when you're on the other end of that call and you've got someone using a mobile phone, the experience that you get is sea sickening. You can't really listen to the person that well. And that poor person having to hold the phone has a deltoid that's probably going to get extremely fatigued and you're really not going to be able to sustain a call for that long. Plus they're probably going to be in a fairly sterile environment. You can't have them in a really high risk environment with a, with a mobile phone that's walking around. So there are some things to unpack there, but yeah, it's definitely a really great question and pretty much one of the first ones I get asked. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, the, the next question is, do you have an idea on top selling devices in this space? I do. So um, it's super hard for me to not be biased on this. So Realware, uh, the Realware head mounted tablet, HMT1, uh, is a 10, uh, between, nobody knows the full statistics because we're not a publicly listed company. So only the publicly listed companies have to buy, you know, tell you exactly what their figures are. Um, we believe uh, from a realware standpoint that realware is market leading five to one. The closest competitor to realware as far as we believe is Vuzix with the M400 unit. And, um, you know, from as, as far as we are aware from our market research would be sort of Google Glass would be like 10 to one, we'd outperform 10 to one. So we've got about... 50, between 50 and 60,000 devices deployed globally. Uh, and the next closest would be, you know, five times less than that. So Realware, Vuzix, uh, and um, Google Glass Enterprise 2. And there's some challenges with, um, with, with the software stack, um, the hardware stack. So if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, uh, feel free to let me know. It's not something I want to talk too much about publicly in a recording. Thanks, Cameron. Well, the, the next question is and probably related to, to your comment just around the construction industries. Have you, have you tried discussing the culture issue with any of the construction training centres? So, no, I haven't. I have uh, been involved in un union meetings in rail. I've been involved in uh, industry body meetings with oil and gas, mining and uh, the universities are the TAFEs that are educating process operators in oil and gas. I haven't had access to the construction uh, bodies and um, very much the initial reactions that I get from the folks that I deal with in construction is it's not, it's, it's a non-event. So there's a little bit to unpack there and I haven't had the, um, I haven't been fortunate enough to be invited to have any of those discussions. So I'm really keen to unpack that further with anyone if they have access to for, to have a you know an open discussion about this type of stuff. Thanks, Cameron. I think that uh, that wraps up the questions. Um, I'm sure some people will definitely come to you privately, Cameron. So 
uh, to, to learn a little bit more. But uh, on behalf of the Save Step and, and all that have attended today, Cameron, thank you. Fascinating presentation. Um, for all the attendees, the webinar has been recorded and, and will be uploaded onto the Save Step website by next week. Uh, and, and you'll also find recordings of past webinars on there as well. Um, as a reminder, this is the second of a four part series. Uh, the next webinar will be held on the 30th of September. Uh, and we look forward to continuing the dialogue uh, with you all then. Cameron, thanks again. Thanks, everybody.